seconds to go for our live streams to start. And then Jennifer's going to get going. Thanks for being with us, everybody. here. So we've been working uh, over the past couple weeks talking about COVID-19 and trying to bring the most relevant information that we can to you guys. But please understand this information is seems to be changing and I'm not kidding here daily. So Medicare has made many changes daily. So this is kind of all up in the air and we're kind of all in the same boat here. So I know we're going to try and work on some insurance billing issues. What I did is I took some questions from last week and then I'm going to bring and I'm going to go through those and hopefully that will help answer some of the questions any of you currently have. And then I'm going to go over a little bit of information and then we'll see what we can, you know, do some chat with and try and figure out for to help you guys here. So we're going to go over some of the insurance billing. Now, I know Alicia has done some of the diagnosis with COVID, some examples, and I'm going to try and handle it from the other end. And we're going to try and piece it all together here and try and get as many of these claims as we can going to the insurance companies and trying to get them paid for our providers. So I'm just going to start with some of these questions that we had, and then I'll bring up to date some new information. So a question we had from last week was, how do we know when to use the telehealth codes versus an e-visit code? So there is a little difference here. So between the telehealth, this is a real-time communication. So we got to remember real time. This is an interaction between two people and uh, normally the beneficiary and a provider of some kind. And they're in different locations. So this is not somebody who's in a parking lot, talk, you know, kind of thing. Um, we need to do different locations. And this is all being opened up. I mean, they really are opening up everything right now. CMS has just as of this week allowed even new patient inpatient consults, emergency rooms, home, home health, hospice. They are pretty much looking at just about any location possible for a provider to be in or the patient on the other end. So this is a lot different than what originally telehealth was being used for. Telehealth originally was for those rural areas, the way out, way out in the woods types of areas where you didn't have access to providers. That's the original intent with telehealth. So this is drastically changing under COVID and they call it a public health emergency. You'll see it abbreviated as PHE. So this is an emergency situation. So we are talking for telehealth real-time communication from one site to another between a patient and a provider with interactive audio and video telecommunication. Very important keywords right there, audio and video. Now don't, we'll, we'll get to those telephone calls and for the people who don't have cell phones or computers, we'll deal with that. But we're talking telehealth. There's a difference in these codes. Telehealth. Imagine this is your normal face-to-face -face visit. The normal visits you're going to be providing, whether you're in a nursing home, a skilled nursing facility, the emergency room, an office, um, a patient's house even. So you still have people who go to the patient's home to make uh, house calls or whether they're home health or something like that, a particular provider. You're still doing that face to face. So imagine you still need that face to face requirement, which is why there's audio and video. We still need to have face to face. We still need to see them. We still need to interact with them, have those questions back and forth, the dialogue um, versus chatting. No, 
versus online portals? No, that's different. So just imagine that face-to-face -face and keep that in mind. And that's what our telehealth is. Now there are e-visits that can be used. And this is not just CMS. A lot of carriers are using some of these other types of descriptive services uh, versus the face-to-face. E-visits is a non-face-to-face -face communication via your online patient portal. So CMS a long time ago started one of the MIPS and MACRA requirements is having those patient portals. And everybody has them, okay, sign up for a portal. You can access your medical records. You can pay your bills. You can ask questions of the provider. So that's an e-visit. A virtual check-in is similar. So imagine this is a check-in. Hi, how are you doing? A check-in in a brief communication synchronous synchronous means same time asynchronous is you do one thing and then a while later i'll do something else synchronous same time so it can be a discussion via the telephone um, an assessment but what is a 99212 that's a face to face. So we've got to keep those definitions in mind. And it's very, it's very important to look at the definition behind what these mean. And then it's going to help it click as to which services fall into which category. So I know we'll we'll bring it out some a little bit more. I'm just trying to catch some of these questions and then we'll expand on, on what we're doing here. So everybody's knowing that there's a modifier, right? 95, well, what about GT? What about GQ? What about CR, DR? There's so many different modifiers out there that people are throwing left and right. What do I do? Which modifier do I use? Well, which, mod which insurance company are you billing? What kind of service are you providing? It really is confusing. And it's gonna change daily, because like I said, Medicare was one thing, wouldn't you know, March 31st, they changed your mind. Got something else out now. So it it's really is difficult. We need to stay on top of these. Modifiers are carrier dependent because they're all different. Nobody all likes to be the same. They all like to be their own unique model. And they do change overnight. I'm not kidding, literally overnight. So modifier CR and DR, those are used for catastrophe situations and disaster related situations um, for facility, non-facility, institutional claims. For Medicare, they are not requiring CR and DR at this time. So that is, they're not requiring those. So don't worry about CRDR. Don't worry about, oh, I've got multiple modifiers going on here. I need to use modifier 99 because I got so many modifiers going on. We don't need to worry about CR and DR right now. This is a nationwide pandemic. Everybody's under the same situation. Now, if you don't know what CR and DR are, those are catastrophe and disaster. Um, think hurricane areas, right? Um, uh, Puerto Rico or earthquake problems, you know, places that have had a catastrophe or a disaster, those are different than other places that were not affected by that hurricane or that earthquake, right? So they're a lot different. This is nationwide. Everybody is under the same COVID problems. Every state is having COVID related issues, illnesses, unfortunately um, deaths. So there are a lot of things going on in relation to COVID. So this is nationwide. Now, the link I provided here, I will have it again and on the resource page, but the American Health Insurance, America's Health Insurance Plan is a conglomerate of pretty much everybody other than CMS. CMS. So they have this, this, I pulled it up again right before here. This is updated as of today, April 2nd. So they are constantly updating their site. And if you have an insurance plan that you're curious about, check this out.
they will have the information for you or they have a link for you as well to provide it straight to your carrier whether it's Cigna, whether it's Pioneer Health, whether it's TRICARE, whether it's um, some plan particular to your state or to your region, they are gonna have the information there or have as much information as possible to be able to direct you to where you could possibly find the information that you need. So we had a question again, why are some places charging for COVID testing and others are free? So this actually, um, this question came about last week and you'll probably see um, news articles out there from New York Times or Washington Post or you know where, wherever you may be, LA Times or something, that you're gonna see these stories of I had COVID and now I have a $40,000 bill from my health insurance company. Well, remember this stuff is changing all the time. Now, COVID, we've started first seeing information back in the beginning of February. CMS started throwing out information in the beginning of February. Well, we didn't reach these states where these this level of uh, where we're at, you know, to this emergency level until sometime in March. And now, so things are just drastically changing. So it depends. If your hospital maybe took the test and sent it to some kind of out-of-network provider, some kind of out-of-network laboratory, there might be a bill from that. The date the test was conducted because it wasn't mandated by all the states until sometime around March 16th. So perhaps somebody had a test done prior to that. And there was no institute then stating that um, these are free. The diagnosis, I mean, I was just talking to Boyd before we started. My state as of today, we have about 2,200 confirmed cases throughout our entire state and 18,000 negative tests. So we've tested approximately 20,000 people and what is that, 10% of them have tested positive, all the rest tested negative. And these have been coming in, these have been reported you know, for a while now. So who knows, it could be the diagnosis. It could be, it could be. It could be your insurance carrier wanted something specific. Um, a reasonable charge, they use that, that we're gonna do a reasonable charge. Well, your insurance company, as we know, only pays a particular amount. Well, what if the laboratory feels the reasonable charge is $500 and the insurance company says no $100? Well, that reasonable charge, they might make the patient responsible for. Self-insured plans. Self-insured plans are different. They are self-insured. They're not mandated by the government. So certain states may mandate to the insurance commission of that state or the insurance carriers that they want this covered. And it could include self-insured, maybe not. So self-insured is usually a problem. A lot of people are self-insured. They kind of don't like to go to the doctor because it is such a large expense for them. Um, the provider decided against the test or something like, you know, well, we feel you didn't need that test here. Let's try this test then. Well, maybe that other influenza A or whatever test they're putting you through, maybe that's not covered, but you went there because you had COVID symptoms. So there, there's a lot of different words and meanings that come into this, or they could have had given you a whole gamut of tests and one of them was COVID. And all those other tests that they took, you did one big vial blood and they did four tests out of it or something like that. You know, I, I'm not sure. I'm not in a laboratory, so I'm not exactly sure how that works. And I know it's a swab, but I'm just saying, you know, they could have done some other tests in relation to that. And then perhaps, you know, that's why they said, oh, well, those aren't covered. So it is, it, there's a lot of verbiage thrown out there. Oh, it's free. Well, you have to meet certain criteria before it's free. So those are um, state mandated. Now it's federal, however, and they're trying to get everybody on the same page. So definitely if somebody's complaining, if you have a patient complaining that they pay something, 
send them straight to their insurance carrier and make sure that they get it straightened out with their insurance carrier. Provide all the documentation you can to help that patient fight this charge with their insurance carrier. So can we use a Skype type of app and bill 99201 or you know, up to 99205, our office visit E&M codes? So what do they say about how the format is? This information is directly from HHS, and there's a link at the bottom, okay? I forgot to bring my water in here. Under this notice, covered healthcare providers can use popular applications to allow video chats like FaceTime, uh, Facebook Messenger video chat, Google Hangout, Zoom, Skype. Um, they are relaxing the requirement for a HIPAA compliant uh, pro uh, I can't think of the word, uh, performance platform, platform, that's it, a HIPAA required platform. Um, but they're asking for the best, you know, judgment and the, you know, good faith of treating the patient. Now they do say that Facebook Live, Twitch, I never even heard of that one, TikTok, or some of the other videos, because those are public. Those are put out to the public. When you do FaceTime, it's between you and somebody else. You could maybe bring in a third party or something, but it's not put out to everybody. So the public applications, no way. You don't want any of that information getting out there or the ones that have the other platforms that can go to the public. So it needs to be something private. And they even give further suggestion to at least go to a different area, a different room, where or try and be as silent as possible. Ask the patient to go to a different room. You don't want screaming kids in the background. You don't want them in the middle of the grocery store, you know, something like that, or at the drive-through of the bank where somebody can hear them on their speakerphone. So there's, you know, certain um, criteria that they're asking for, but just remember, we always want to keep in mind that we don't want to give away any patient information. That's very important. So we are trying to be, they're trying to be lenient at this time, but we also need to keep in mind that we can't be giving out private health inf information. So information about CPT codes to use for commercial carriers. And I'm telling you, I did this last week and I went down each carrier and I said, okay, this is what healthcare, this is what United Healthcare says. This is what Aetna says. This is what Cigna says. The next day I spent a couple hours compiling it all into a spreadsheet. And so Friday we put it out there for our club members. Monday it changed. Tuesday it changed again. <laughs> so this information is constantly changing. So it's difficult to put it in some kind of format and um, but it depends on the insurance carrier. So I gave an example. Aetna has asked for a place of service O2. With a GT or 95, they have 17 different codes that you're able to use for telehealth. And the difference between GT and 95 is some of the codes are HICPIC codes and some of the codes are CPT codes. So if you have a HICPIC code, you're using GT. If you have a CPT code, you're using 95. But now Cigna says they want the place of service to match the CPT code. And they want a GQ modifier. And you can do either G2012 or face-to-face -face e m codes. So if you do a face-to-face -face e and m code 99213, you're going to use an 11 place of service. So everybody is different. And again, I put that link to the America's Health Insurance Plan website on there because they do have just about everybody listed. They will have links. They will break it down for you. They will say, oh, they only want COVID-related items or they're do this, or you have to use their Teladoc platform, or it, it just depends. Every single carrier is different. And so kind of one thing I, I'm looking at suggesting, maybe hold off on some of these claims because there's gonna be some different information coming out. 
Now I did see this multiple times. People have asked about annual wellness visit because annual wellness visit has been a code that can be used via telehealth prior to COVID. This is an established code that you could use via telehealth. And I have searched for days and I have not found exact information to answer that particular question. How do you get the patient's vitals if it's telehealth? So it is, how do you? I don't know. So I have not found any information that on CMS that can direct us exactly to that answer. I did put out the question to a CMS representative today, but of course I haven't heard back uh, via email. So I even tried to do the chat with my local Mac carrier today. The chat's not even available because nobody's there. They're all, um, they're all remotely working, but I guess be, even though they're remotely working, nobody's monitoring the chat. So I can't ask that question. So I'd like to. So I did email um, somebody and I'm not sure if I'll get an answer back because I'm sure they're quite busy and quite inundated with emails then. So one thing that we see about CMS for the annual wellness visit is they say the measurement, this is for initial and subsequent, so G0438 and 0439, the measurement of an individual's weight or their waist circumference, their blood pressure and other routine measurements as deemed appropriate based on their individual's medical and family history. I'm trying, I underline that myself because that's the only thing I could see out of this as deemed appropriate. Perhaps in this case, due to COVID, it's not appropriate. I did do some, you know, I've, I think I spent about seven hours today researching some of this stuff and time over the past couple of days to answer questions that have been put in the CCO community. So it, it is difficult to find an exact answer. Now there are platforms that offer telehealth and I kind of, you know, through searching, I kind of got prompted to some of those and they never answered that question, but they kind of said, well, you could do telehealth for por a portion of this visit, but then they had it seem like the patient still comes in and all that partial of that, reg you know, that information is in their electronic medical record then obtained by, pre obtained previously by somebody else to help make the visit flow smoother. But I did not find a direct answer. So if you have a question about the annual wellness visit and how to get those vitals, I do not have an answer. Now, uh, they also say that all services are covered by a provider in their professional judgment. Um, this is about telehealth right now. Believes they can be provided through telehealth in given circumstances in this current emergency of the notification. This includes diagnosis or treatment of COVID related conditions, such as taking the patient's temperature or other vitals remotely. They suggest it in the new information that just came out March 31st, but there's no answer about how you take vitals remotely. Is the patient supposed to stand on their own scale and you see it? Are they supposed to use a thermometer and show you it's 98.3? I don't know. I, it, and I cannot find an answer. Um, now, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Alabama, I got directed there. There's telehealth format. They have it all broken down for you for every code. So if you're in Alabama, that's a great resource for you. It just says standard annual wellness visit documentation applies. BMI and blood pressure are not required when performed via telehealth. Now, I don't know if that's always been said for them, if they're just waiving that because of COVID, I don't know. So it is, an, it is a spreadsheet of information out for COVID telehealth. Um, so that's what they say. So I kind of don't know if it's documentation in the medical record saying unable to obtain or the patient says as of their last visit, March 30th to their other doctor, they weighed 240, I don't know. So I, I apologize, I cannot find an answer to that question. Now, some other information that has come out is the Federal Register 
there is currently a draft out there. And if you Google CMS Federal Register, you'll be directed to it. It is a long document. It's 200 and some pages, I think close to 300 pages. This is going to be released April 6. So this is another reason my personal suggestion would be to hold off on some of these claims for the moment because there's more information coming out April 6. It's going to bring a little bit more clarification, but currently this document is a draft, so it is not an official document yet. So possibly some things might change. They might add more. I don't know, but until it is released April 6 as official, it's currently a draft. So currently what their proposal is in the Federal Register draft is we can use an e &M without leveling history or exam, or they're suggesting we can also use the 2021 guidelines that are going to be coming up for time. Now we know in 2021, our e &M is changing. So they're allowing time as a requirement. This is total time of the practitioner, not the nurse taking all of her assessment when the patient comes in, not phone calls back and forth until you can connect, not clinical, anybody else doing anything with that patient. This is total time of the practitioner. So it's what he's going to document, he or she's going to document for the time that they spent with the patient, again, over the phone, telehealth, video, synchronous. Um, this is time they spent with the patient. So it may fall in the seven minute criteria. Then the, that's what you're going to bill is that level e &M. Or you can use the MDM as it's currently defined because it's going to change in 21. Uh, so if you're going to use MDM, you can do it as it's currently defined. Now this is in the draft of the Federal Register. So April 6, pull up that Federal Register and see what it says. Bring it to your office manager, your compliance officer, whoever needs to make that decision as to how you're going to do your billing after they read the Federal Register. Remember that's CMS. Uh, so as of March 30th, CMS came out saying, we're gonna give 80 new codes, right? As of March 31st, they said, oh, no, nope, use 95 as a modifier. Don't use O2 place of service. Use the place of service compliant with the code that you're billing. So in this 331 release, and I do have uh, links to it, the providers can build telehealth visits at the same rate as in person. So they would receive the same amount they would if it was face to face, those key words there, Telehealth visits now include emergency department visits, initial nursing facility and discharge home visits and therapy services, which must be provided by a clinician that's allowed to provide telehealth. Now there are particular, um, if you go straight to the telehealth booklet offered by CMS, it will tell you every provider who's able to build telehealth. So if you're, uh, physical, your physician assistant's able to bill it, your physical therapist, whatever it says as the practitioners, that's who can bill it. So we're not, I, they have not made any reference to um, incident two, uh, because if your PA is registered with Medicare, then the PA should be billing Medicare for their services. So in addition, CMS is allowing physicians to supervise their clinical staff using a virtual technology when appropriate, instead of requiring in-person presence. The physician to supervise their clinical staff. Now the only reference that, again, is not incident two. That's in one bulletin that I have a link for. And then when you click on another link that they reference, it specifically says, their example is, residents and teaching physicians. So residents K 
can be overseen by the teaching physician via telehealth. So they're relaxing some of the requirements because they need as many healthcare providers as possible helping with all of the patients that are coming in and needing to be treated all across the United States. There, this drive, and you, if you read the link, is for bringing in past providers. They're assigning, um, allowing a one-day uh, sign up to treat patients, you know, allowing the scope of their license for that state, please come in and help. That's what they're looking for. Now, these are some of the uh, links that I had, and I'm going to go ahead and start going over some of the questions because this is, um, you know, some of our interactive format here. I'm going to try and get to as many as I can, and I think they're taking them off of um, some of the other uh, social media formats as well. I'm going to do the best I can to answer them. I will tell you, I like I said, I worked on this about seven hours today. So I've read a whole lot of information and I may not be able to pinpoint you to the proper source because I, it's, it all starts to become a jumble at some point in time. And I'll do my best to answer the questions that I can or direct you to where it can go. Um, so we have a question that at the urgent care clinic, the provider's coming out to the patient's car to examine them and swab them. How do you bill for a car visit? And I saw this question specifically on another site and there was not an answer. And I thought, well, I better look into that. Somebody's gonna ask me that. And of course, Whitney, you asked me that. Um, my judgment is you're treating the patient because I didn't look into it, so I didn't get exact clarification. And I don't believe there is clarification currently for this type of situation because I know a lot of urgent care clinics are doing this and the same as those, you know, drive-through tents, well, how do they bill? There has not been anything come out yet that I have seen use this exact place of service. So, this is going to be, we'll go back to, we'll read into their definition of the service provided for the place, the service you're going to be billing, that's the place of service you're going to use. So there is no place of service for parking lot of urgent care clinic. There isn't. So you're, my opinion, you're documenting it as all as if you saw them in the urgent care clinic, you're going to bill it whatever Play, whatever CPT code is justified by the services you're providing, that's the place of service you're going to submit. It's not telehealth because the patient's there. They're just not exactly in your office, they're in their car. So, but you're going to be submitting that claim as if you saw them in your urgent care clinic. So I, I hopefully, you know, they'll have some guidance coming out about that soon because I'm sh I've seen that question out there. So I know other people have this question. And if we read what they're saying as you're gonna bill it as if the place of service that it was for the CPT code, then I think that's how we're gonna answer this question with treating patients in a car. So hopefully that helps. Um, let's see here. Do we use 95 with Medicare G codes? Now, I know I said um, Medicare uh, with a, you know, HCPCS, but Medicare specifically said use the 95 modifier. That's what just came out on uh, the 31st, is to use the 95 modifier for your telehealth codes. Now that's telehealth. Remember your G code, like your G2012, that's not telehealth. That's like a telemedicine that's being done. Telehealth was specifically those face-to-face -face codes. So uh, Medicare did offer, um, they do have more information in this, uh, this, let's see here, which one is it? Um, I think it is this provider fact sheet, possibly the general information for the codes. I cannot remember which one it's in, um, but they do break down. No, it's in the newsletter. It's in the newsletter. Um, they do break down um, what they want, but that is as of 
last week. I think that was as of the 23rd, possibly. So the information has updated. I would directly go to CMS. I would actually wait till April 6th, till this, um, uh, the Federal Register comes out. And then some more information should be now complete then. So um, I, I do have it in a spreadsheet, but I, I'd have to pull it up. Um, let's see here. What do we say about consults and place of service too? Now, consults, of course, that's not Medicare. So we're not worried about Medicare consults. So if you're doing consults, then with a commercial insurance carrier, you're gonna have to look at that commercial insurance carrier's rules. Now, inpatient consult, uh, um, hospital consults, nursing home consults, those are all now being approved. So go to the latest telemedicine list. Um, and it's actually one of these links here is the telemedicine codes and they've added all of the new ones. And what you'll see is it's gonna give you this whole big spreadsheet. And all of the 80 new codes are indicated in the second column saying that um, those codes are now um, effective due to COVID. So the codes that were on there before uh, don't say anything. Those were usually those were previously allowed for telehealth. The new ones they will say affected for COVID, and that's for Medicare's um, new codes that they that they're allowing. Um, so those are face to face type of codes. Most of them are face to face type of codes, like our inpatient um, initial evaluation for the pay for hospitals. Um, so you would bill it the same as you would before. And then Medicare came out on the 31st saying, don't use place of service O2. So you're gonna still use your inpatient place of service with a 95 modifier for CMS for those codes that came out. That's as of today. Let's hope it doesn't change tomorrow and then we'll see what happens on Monday. But these things do change. Uh, it's just amazing. You never see any kind of insurance change their information because they have to give you notice and 90 days notice and make, you know, they have to request it and things like that. But because of this uh, COVID emergency, they're changing those rules. They're, they're kind of, and I can tell you, they are all as curious as we are. So any representative who works in an insurance company, I'm sure their head is spinning as much as ours are. So they're trying to keep up with what they're saying, the claims processing, it might process one day and kick it the next day, and we'll just have to try and send it in again. It's going to be a trial and error process for everybody, unfortunately. Um, let's see here. What I heard about place of service O2 or 11 for telehealth. Again, depends on the carrier. So if it's Medicare, Medicare just said no, don't use the O2 place of service. Unless you are doing traditional telehealth. Traditional telehealth is somebody drives to this remote facility that has tele video, audio, visual communications at some kind of site, and they are dialing in to speak with a provider at another site in a rural environment. We're talking rural outside of the city, backwoods country. You know, this that's the traditional telehealth, or we'll call it original telehealth. If somebody is still performing that service, yes, you're still using O2 because they need to distinguish that that is that true telehealth um, remote facility type of service. But if you're in your office and the patient's at home, you're gonna bill that visit as you would the CPT code, congruent with the CPT code for Medicare, for CMS. So Medicaid, state Medicaid, go to your state Medicaid provider because they're all different. Um, mine doesn't want O2 at all. They don't even recognize it. Uh, so, but some of them only want the G code. 
So some of them will use uh, E&Ms. I mean, it, it really is different depending upon the state. But that information I showed you um, previously here with this one, for example, one insurance carrier does want the place of service O2 and the other one doesn't. So it really is going to depend on the carrier, but Medicare just said, don't use the O2 anymore. Now, do you have to go back and change your claims from last week that you already sent? There is no guidance on that. I, unfortunately, we, we don't know how they're gonna be processed. That's where we need to be keen on knowing what the fee schedule is and making sure it's processed properly because we may have to do some kind of corrections on the back end. It's possible. And the insurance company is going to be expecting that and it's going to be trial and error. Um, let's see here. Does there have to be a video portion of telehealth visit in order to build telehealth? I thought video portion was being waived and that is a big misnomer. There are patients out there that, believe it or not, do not own a computer or a cell phone, a smartphone with video capability. It is true. Um, how do we do this? There are codes available. We have the G codes. There are 9944 codes, and that's one other reason why we need to wait for this federal register. As of October 6, if this draft is true, that's printed as the true draft that's stated right now, they will, Medicare will allow telephone codes. But it's a particular code. We're not billing the 99213 if we don't see the patient. Remember, 99213 is a face to face code. If you're doing something over the phone, you're going to use a different code. Over the phone, just audio, no video is not a 99213. And I had this written down somewhere that, that it was a good uh, quote for that, and I thought I included it, but I didn't. Um, so it's not that it's not being waived. That's CMS's rule. Another insurance carrier, I cannot answer them all because if you go to the AHIP website for the America's Health Insurance Plan, you will be utterly amazed at how many insurances are out there. When I first pulled up that site last week and was using it, they just listed some of the carriers. Now, as of today, they have an ABC index across the top because there are so many insurances on there that if you want to go all the way down to Pennsylvania Blue Cross Blue Shield, you should click on P because there are so many insurances listed. And unfortunately, I bet every single one of them says something different. Now, Medicare is not waiving that video component. True telehealth, face-to-face -face services, you still need video. There are going to be using telephone codes, and those are going to be different. OK, so um, you're going to use the particular code that best matches the services you're provided. If you didn't have video, according to Medicare, you're not billing a 99213. Maybe Cigna, Aetna, U.S. Family Health Plan, maybe one of those other carriers say it's OK. Medicare, no. Uh, let's see here. Try and get to another. Um, if the doctor provided a visual exam through the window due to a waiting room limit contact, is that telehealth? That is actually a specific question in one of these Medicare uh, uh, links that says that exact scenario. No, that is not telehealth. And it says that if, you know, does counting, does talking through the glass of the waiting room count? No. You're, that's, I know you can see them, <laughs> but that's not a telehealth communication. So I don't know what that's constituted as. I would imagine if you meet the assessments of an office visit and it's all medically documented and medically appropriate and medically necessary, then it would be an office visit. Um, but it, that 
exact question says no. That is not telehealth to talk through a window. Let's see here. Oh, okay. So somebody does work for the Mac carrier. Um, and one of the same kind of questions that, you know, we've been talking about. So yeah. Um, and, and this is CMS, remember. So CMS is the national advisor and then the MAC carriers are different. So when I went to Novatos as my MAC carrier and I asked them that question, uh, or I wanted to ask them the question about annual wellness visit, um, you know, when fortunately, when I, and I thought, okay, well, what does Novatos say about all this? I'm here, might as well look it up. And fortunately, what they have is the link straight back to CMS. So in this instance, Novatos, they're directing whatever CMS says, that's what Novatos is going to do. What WPS or First Choice or whatever any of the other Mac providers out there are going to do, I would definitely confirm with them as well for the Mac in your area. Um, probably they're just going to direct you back to the CMS and follow the CMS rules. Um, because I know originally all the different MAC carriers had something different for telehealth. Um, some of them wanted O2, some of them wanted 95, some of them wanted either the GT or the GO or depending upon the circumstance of um, the telehealth visit. So, um, but I only looked up Novatos because I happened to be looking them for another question for somebody had a particular Maryland question. Um, but the other Max, I would confirm with them as well and just make sure that they're following CMS, that, that they're not doing their own separate thing. Uh, let's see here. I'm gonna, I lost track of where I was, so let me go back and see if I can answer some more. Um, for G2012, place of service 02. If telehealth video is 99213, place of service 11. Yeah, <laughs> a little frustrated with that. Yes, it is <laughs> kind of unfortunate um, that they have so many different criteria, but I would definitely confirm um, what they have. Uh, and I did have it on that spreadsheet. And maybe I'll try and I'll try and pull that up. Um, when is modifier 95 versus GT? Again, depends upon the insurance carrier. Currently, Medicare is looking for 95 for services that are related to these ENMs. Um, if you're using the traditional telehealth format of a remote facility to a provider and GT meets that criteria, then you would still use GT if you're using the traditional telehealth format. But if we're doing office visit and I'm talking to the patient in their house or I'm talking to the patient at the skilled nursing facility while I'm in the office using this new revamped telehealth due to COVID, then you're using 95 for Medicare. For any other insurance carrier, we have to check their website. There are just, even just Blue Cross itself has well over 50 uh, insurance plans and they're probably all different. So each one. Uh, let's see here. Is there another code other than 96060 when billing genetic counseling with Medicaid with telehealth? Now, I do know Medicaid telehealth, it depends on the state. So unfortunately, you're going to have to look up your state uh, provider's manual and see what they say about telehealth. Now, they may be adjusting something right now, which they should have on their website to let you know. I, everybody's got COVID-19 updates as a link. And if you click on it, and it's right on their front page, you click on that, it will tell you what their updates are. Um, but then I would, if they don't say anything specifically, then you're going to revert to what their policy already is. And you're gonna have to look in, because every state's different. Um, Medicaid has the only thing CMS, which is Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. So they kind of, institute the policies of both. The only thing that they've put out right now is they are not requiring anything to be paper signed consenting to e-visits and 
telephone services and things like that, which you do know these all have to be consented by the patient as well. You need to ask them. You need to ask them first if you can provide the service to them. Um, when they refer to it as patient-initiated service, um, that's not your office calling every patient in your directory saying, hi, we offer telehealth. Did you want to take advantage of that? No, it's the patient already has an appointment and they're calling saying, I'm kind of worried about coming in. Maybe I feel a little not well or something like that. I don't have a ride or something. I'm worried about our uh, stay at home directives that we have. You can, that's when your office notifies them. Well, we do offer telehealth services. Would you like to keep your appointment as a telehealth? And they agree to that, okay. Then at that normal appointment time, the doctor can call them and they can go over everything then and bill appropriately for whatever service was provided. Um, but the, we need to have consent of the patients and it should be documented. A verbal consent is fine, but it should be documented in the medical record that you obtained consent from the patient. So as far as genetic counseling, you'd have to go back to your local state carrier and see what they say. So you can be able to look up their provider manual it should be on their website or be able to search provider manual and uh, off of their website and it should direct you to it and they will tell you their telehealth codes because i have seen that um, some states say they want this code some states use the hic codes for um, medic medical assistance claims um, so it just depends on what your state requires some of them say o2 some of them say don't use that some of them say use this code instead so unfortunately, you'd have to go back to your state. Um, I'm getting confused. Can we use a regular, uh, you're not the only one I tell you, I was so stressed today, I, I popped open a can of Coke. I don't normally do that. Um, so can we use a regular E&M 99212 to 213 for telephone calls? No, <laughs> a 99212 and a 99213 are face-to-face -face codes. You need to use a face-to-face -face format. They can be on their telephone using the video and audio, or they could be at their computer using video and audio. Synchronous video communications is required for a 99212 and 99213 for Medicare. Cigna, maybe they want something else. Maybe they allow it. Um, you know, Emblem Health, maybe they allow it. I don't know. Now, most medic, uh, medical advantage plans, so Aetna's medical Medicare Advantage Plan, United Healthcare's Medicare Advantage Plan, most of the major carriers' Medicare Advantage plans are going to follow CMS most of them, I would confirm that on their website. Go straight to that providers, you know, whether it's uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Western New York, whether whoever it is, look that up and confirm it. Um, but the most of them are following CMS. And I do believe on that uh, America's Health Insurance Plan website, they are including Medicare Advantage plans as well. So that is a good place to look as well for the Medicare Advantage plans. Um, 99212 to 213, any of those E&M codes for Medicare, you have to use audio visual. Now remember April 6th, when this um, directive comes out, the current draft does not include that. The current draft includes the telephone 9944 codes to use for telephone services and as described by CPT. So however it's described in CPT, which I think off the top of my head, now like I said, I've looked at, I don't know how much stuff today. So off the top of my head, I believe those telephone codes are for if you haven't had a visit in the last seven days and it doesn't result in a visit in the next 24 hours or soonest available appointment. I believe that's a requirement of those codes as well. So you could use one of those, but check the confirmation April 6th for Medicare after this directive comes out. 
Uh, let's see here. Can I go over a little bit about billing telehealth and a hospitalist's round? Is there any way to get higher than a 231 when they don't do an exam or do the visual exam if a patient has sepsis, pneumonia, respiratory failure, and COVID? They have been told that those visits must be time document, must have time documented or not billable. Um, that's a good standard to go by after April 6th. <laughs> so um, they're gonna allow time then. There has been no specific guideline up until now about time. Um, so you gotta also think to, um, what can they do if they're not doing that exam or, or something like that? Some of the history component, especially in the hospital, that's kind of all reverberated unless they're actually going over it again with the patient, even via telehealth. You know, has anything changed since this was last assessed? There hasn't, did your medications increase? Did you have any reactions? You know, even going over that HPI, and then your medical decision-making process is going to come in for the other component of leveling currently as it stands without using time. So can you get higher than some of those only based upon your MDM and your HPI? I don't know. That's like they say a 99215 is available to use. Are we going to get a 99215 via telehealth if we can't examine the patient? I don't know. It, the, it's a difficult call. So if you think about some of the criteria that's required for leveling an E&M to get some of those high level visits, they got to really be severe. Or, you know, even with your three uh, diagnoses, you still have to die. You still have to indicate whether they're worsening or severe or better. Um, you still have to make sure all those documentation points are there. So uh, as far as the hospital is concerned, that's a good guideline to include, to include that time, because it could be their um, policy for compliance that they're going to go based upon time. That could be what they're using. Um, so I don't know if you can get higher than a 99213 without actually being present. Sometimes that's kind of difficult to do. Um, you might only be able to look at them and see that they are reacting and that they're responsive and they're answering your questions and they're coherent without being able to feel the abdomen and, you know, do some of those other things. All right. Almost done here, but let's see if it, we have any other questions. Um, I haven't heard this one before. Is it true that insurances are now going to accept as many progress notes a day as there are, whether there are three, four, or five? I haven't heard that. Um, and that would probably be dependent upon the insurance. Um, I know that currently they're not doing audits and things like that, and they're not requesting records currently because they want these people devoted to patients not doing this back work, not gathering stuff. So they, they want to have doctors, they're getting rid of some of the paperwork portion or in some of those other requests and things like that, not getting rid of the paperwork portion, but um, the patients over paperwork initiative by Medicare, they're kind of halting that right now so that the physicians are not gonna be so burned out um, and can concentrate on patients because they're just seeing just such a huge influx of patients and not enough people to help them. And so they're, they're really trying to devote time just for the providers to look at patients right now. So I haven't heard that, I haven't seen that anywhere and I've done a lot of looking around today, just especially today, uh, if not earlier this week. So I, I don't know for sure about that one. I'm sorry, Whitney. Yep, critical care codes were just approved for telehealth, which is really good. Um, uh, monitoring codes, um, you could uh, assign the patient if they have a chronic problem, assign them uh, some kind of interactive device, whether it's a Bluetooth type of device or a, a, a card or something that they're going to have to load in the office once a month or somebody would have to obtain, um, whether it's a pulse ox or 
blood pressure or something like that. So a lot of those things can also be done by a device that's remote as well. So there are some good things that are helping with this telehealth, but remember they're all to keep our patients healthy. So we wanna keep the patient healthy and, and not get COVID. Is coding different for a federally qualified health and uh, knew this question include the information. Um, uh, they are different. They are not using any telehealth codes and it specifically says that on the Medicare sites. So when you're looking at these telehealth codes that they have for Med Medicare, they're going to be a nurse and an RN sees them, but they talk on the phone with the doctor. So whatever that RN is able to do, um, because remember it said whoever can bill for those services. So they did, there is some more in this um, outreach. The second one there, the background sweeping regulatory changes, the second link right there. They do have a lot of information about hospitals and what those providers are able to do. Where they're trying to seek additional help from uh, other people in the office so that the physicians can see patients. So I would definitely wait for April 6th and see what that directive that comes out says um, about uh, if an RN could do those type of service, but it's typically whatever they're allowed in that state and by that facility to do, then they are able to perform those services. And they do talk about that in one of those news releases there. And I think I have one final question. The insurers have always accepted all the work done in one day to assign a code. Time will be cumulative. If four visits, can add time for each and pick the appropriate code. I'm trying to assess what that means. So the insurers have always accepted all the work done in one day. Okay, so everything that's done in one day, then you assign a code. So, and that time is cumulative. So if they have four visits, can you add the time for each and pick the appropriate code? I'm trying to think of a scenario where you'd have that. Um, because if you're like an inpatient hospital, um, you know, you're still going to fall back to how they describe floor time and such for CPT. If the you're doing some kind of monitoring, you can add the minutes, yes. Um, if you're, and then, and then it just bills based upon the minutes for monitoring with add-on codes for additional minutes. Um, but I'm, I hope that answered the question. Um, it's sometimes a little difficult to understand the um, questions coming in through chat. So, because we don't, we can't spell them all out and everything. Um, I hope this was beneficial to you guys. This was kind of a continuation of last week. If you're able to pull up last week's information, um, I went over a lot of the commercial insurance carriers in particular, um, but definitely there are some good resources out there um, to look up. So definitely keep yourself educated. Sign up for all the listservs that you can, especially right now. Oh, CMS will notify you the second they send it out. Um, you'll be informed. Um, try and stay on top of things. Remember, don't right now we can't go with the, well, this is how we always did it in the past because this is a totally new game right now. We've got a new territory that everybody's trying to figure out. The doctors are, the patients are, the billers are, and the insurance companies are. So we're all trying to figure out how we can make this happen. Um, Medicare, CMS, Medicaid services, they are, they don't have a deadline. Most of the federal plans currently don't have a deadline until the emergency is lifted is their expiration date. Some of the commercial insurance carriers, however, are offering expiration dates of 90 days, which started back in March, in the beginning of March. So um, definitely keep track of the carriers, go onto their websites, update your information. 
um, hold off on claims maybe until you get all of the correct information. I know people don't like to do that, but sometimes it's better to have it all done right than to do multiple steps on the back end trying to get it corrected. So, um, you know, hopefully this helped you. We will definitely do more information as much as we can. More things come out. Put a question into the um, uh, chat if you have another question about it and we'll look it up and we'll try and help you the best we can and direct you to a good place, um, a good reference point. So we don't like to just use things that we found on social media or something. We like to go directly to the source when we can and find you the best information. And if the source doesn't have it, then unfortunately we'll you know, try and come up with the, our best guess based upon other sources. But um, you know, we're all learning in this process, but we're making it fun. So I hope you guys have a good evening. Good, good, good. Thanks. Bye.